marketplace is going electric. A light that came on is a check electric vehicle system. And I started thinking, like, well, the whole car is electric. What is that? Hitting the road and testing the range. Batteries all topped up. Let's see how far we can get. Are EVs right for you? We've got a lineup of cars waiting for a charge. Or will the challenges of charging change your mind? Please unplug. Like, this is ridiculous. Are you happy with how fast we're moving? Consumers are not. I want us to move faster, of course. This is your marketplace. We're in an electric car on the way to Ottawa. It's fast, sleek, and with all the latest tech. But inside the cabin, the anxiety is real. So there's another warning. Stay below 105 kilometers an hour to reach destination. Range, the distance you can travel on a single charge is a big deal for EV drivers. And you tell us your cars are sometimes coming up short. The mileage in the winter drops quite substantially. She drives slow and we can't turn on the heat because then our miles will disappear like that. EVs are here, and eventually we're all expected to make the switch, with the feds doubling down on their plan to see all new car and truck sales be zero emission by 2035. So we're taking on range, charging, and repairs to see if we're on track for an all-electric future. Let's start with range. We're taking a winter road trip to see how far we can travel on a single charge. Range is central to the automaker's pitch, and the number is based on standard testing that combines simulated city and highway driving. But there's no specific range info for coal. For our test, we pick the most affordable model from the biggest name in EVs, the Tesla Model 3. Fully charged, our car's range today is 425 kilometers. OK, so let's punch in our destination. And we pick a route, this Tesla supercharger in Pickering, Ontario, to the CBC building in Ottawa. That 410 kilometer distance is within our range. OK, batteries all topped up. Let's see how far we can get. Right off the bat, we're told we're not going to make it. But just minutes later, things change. So there's a warning on this screen already saying stay below 100 kilometers an hour to reach the destination. But on a highway? Really? So we keep going to see what happens. While our Tesla rolls along, let's shift gears to our second test, charging. We're checking on fast charging stations from leading brands, Flow, ChargePoint, Ivy, and Petro Canada, visiting three for each. But first, we visit Tesla's network. Experts say it's the largest and one of the best. There's no issue with the charging station. It's all good. But even this network has its moments. So what are the chances that we are here today? There's a technician here from Tesla that's working on a couple of the pumps. So he's saying they're not actually broken, but in order to diagnose the problem, he has to shut them off so you can't charge while he's working on them. We've got a lineup here of cars waiting for a charge. So there are four cars now in line that have showed up waiting for a charge since we've got here. Out of service chargers are a common complaint. So we want to see if the ones we visit actually work and if we come across any other problems along the way. Let's charge it up. We only visit locations the companies say are working. At this flow location. Oh, here it goes. So it's working. It's working. We're charging. And at this IV machine. We are charging. Did you hear a click? But okay. not every visit goes smoothly. Like, am I doing something wrong, though? It takes multiple fails with Petro Canada's app. OK, we're in. Like, what am I doing wrong? OK, go. Before we try a different machine using a credit card. And then, success. Seriously. <gasps> 
But we're not so lucky at this charge point location. Come on. No, nothing. The app won't start the charging session. It is not going. Mary Annabella and her family know all about charging challenges. They experienced them while taking their week-old Nissan Leaf on its first road trip. So we were really excited. My daughter was very excited to sleep in a tent for the first time ever. Still new to the world of EVs, she and her husband Google a route that includes fast chargers. He saw, okay, there's one, there's one, there's one, and what could go wrong? Like most EV drivers, they typically charge at home with a level two charger. It's cheap, but takes hours. On the go, level three or fast charging will top you up quickly. Problem is... The fast charger was disabled. They can't find one that's working. We try to connect our vehicle to it, and there's an error message. After four stops, they're desperate for a charge and make a tough call at a slow charger. So I said to my husband, you're going to have to sleep in the car because it's going to take seven hours to charge it. Marianne and her daughter head to a hotel. It took us all day trying to find a charger and then finally giving up on a night of camping um, to stay in a hotel room, you know, the kind of hotel where people either live there or can, you know, pay by the hour. I can't imagine with a young daughter that this is like an ideal situation. Yeah, it really wasn't. And uh, so it was clear that we weren't gonna get anywhere. Back with our charging test, this Ivy machine works. Charging, okay. This Petro Canada station looks promising too but it gives out before the session actually starts. We share our results with George Eaney of the Automobile Protection Association. If you're deploying electric charging infrastructure, it should be to match the convenience and ease okay. of the gasoline charging infrastructure. Sure. Overall, we visit 12 locations. At seven, we have challenges with charging, including two locations where we can't charge. You should be very far away from finding any failures. Okay. I mean, we expect, you know, if you're placing a cell phone call or filling up with gasoline, you expect, you know, I don't know, 99.9 okay. plus reliability. Now, when it comes to cost, prices are all over the map. Some say per minute, some say per hour, and the energy output can differ too. But only one location we visit bills by something called the kilowatt hour. That's the charging equivalent of by the liter for gas powered cars. Experts and many EV drivers agree, saying this should be the standard across the board. It ensures you're paying for the energy you get, not the time it takes to charge. To get a better sense of what you're paying for when you charge, we do a price check across the four companies to get a kilowatt hour comparison. So we're gonna charge this car for 20 minutes and see how much charge we get when we're done. We started our charge at 20% battery. Let's see where we get. We do the math for the locations we visit. At charge point, it's about 25 cents per kilowatt hour. At flow, 42 cents. At both Ivy and Petro Canada, it's 50 cents per kilowatt hour. Our final bills range from $5.20 to $10.09. The brands don't always set the prices, but you could be paying up to twice as much for the same charge depending on where you go. We share our findings with all four companies. ChargePoint says they have fixed some of the issues we've raised and independent owners set the prices. Flow adds it's often the same at their stations too and their machines work more than 98% of the time. Ivy says they're one of the first to adopt kilowatt hour pricing and they're committed to improving their processes. And Petro Canada says they're working to meet the needs of customers and they provide pricing that's competitive in each province. Back with our cold weather range test. 
We're just about halfway through our trip, but here's the thing. Our car is telling us we don't have enough range left in order to travel the distance we still need to go. But we're not giving up just yet. Running out of road. I'm really nervous that we're not going to make it. When we come back, we ask who exactly is taking charge. We visited 12 locations. We had challenges charging at seven. It's still an emerging sector, so of course there's going to be wrinkles. Get more Marketplace. Sign up for our weekly newsletter at cbc.ca slash marketplace. This is your Marketplace. We're going electric, looking at the cars in your future and challenges you're facing today. With range, you can see now the car's telling us that we actually will get to where we're going with 2% battery. And charging. It took us all day trying to find a charger. We're driving to Ottawa to see how far we can get on a single charge when it's cold. Okay, so this just popped up on our screen. It's a battery low warning. It says there will be significantly less energy available from your battery if it gets colder. We recommend charging now. So we are not going to make it. We only have 77 kilometers of range left on the vehicle, and we have 129 kilometers left to go on our trip. We are not going to get to Ottawa. Not a surprise to George Eney, who doesn't buy the range estimates promoted by automakers. We would like to see something called effective range. Hmm. That would bear in mind the technical limitations of the batteries okay. and the reality that what you really care about is highway range and not a combined range. He and other experts are also calling for more transparency when it comes to winter driving. Well, a, a cold weather range would be helpful, but extreme cold, sure. say minus 20, yeah. standardized. Yeah. with a test cycle that would consider the loss of range because the batteries can't sure. function optimally and also because you're heating the cabin. Batteries don't perform as well in cold weather. Research has found range can be cut nearly in half. Tesla also warns that cold weather can increase energy consumption. So we end our range test here, about 70% of the way. When we share our range test results with Tesla, they provide no comment. Once again, charging up to head home doesn't work out so well. So we've just attempted to charge the car twice, and both times it has failed. Charging failed. That's the third time it's failed. We hit a Tesla supercharger to get us back on the road. Now it's time to tackle electric vehicle repair. I don't get an update unless I go in and ask. Meet Chad Barnes. In September 2022, he's on his way to work when he gets a warning from his Hyundai Ioniq. A light that came on is to check electric vehicle system. And right. I started thinking like, well, the whole car is electric, so. What What is that? After work, he heads to the dealership. They can't figure it out, and his car has to stay. So I went home for the weekend and didn't hear anything back until probably about the middle of the next week, and they called me and told me that Honda High Tech said, yeah, you need a new battery. A new battery. A new battery. The battery is basically the lifeblood well, the, of the, the vehicle. The battery is the car. Fast forward. We are over a year later. Mm -hmm. Where are things at? About the same. Uh, so I contact the dealership regularly, and uh, they just keep giving me a new date as to when it's supposed to be here. So what is happening? To me, it seems like nothing. It, the car's sitting there. The car's sitting, yep. Yeah. They give him a rental, but still, it costs him. Like, I'm putting gas into it, because the, the rental I got is like a gas-powered car. Hold on, you have an EV so that you can save money on gas. It's been in the shop for over a year and you've been paying for gas that entire time? Yes. Is that at your own expense? That's my own expense. So just to be clear, 
you have been in contact regularly with the dealership, but yeah. you have reached out to Hyundai Canada. Have they given you an official response about what's happening? No. no. Nothing. Nothing. Like they did tell me to to that I should speak to the dealership. I don't envy the manufacturers. Mechanic Emily Chung says the supply of parts is just one of the repair issues causing headaches for EV owners. I know that they have issues with their supply chain, um, and I think it goes to the whole issue of supply and demand, right? right? You don't have a lot of these parts. You don't have a lot of them built in the aftermarket either. Her biggest concern, she says automakers aren't sharing enough information. What's really um, challenging about it is that every manufacturer can do it differently. There's right. no like standardized, here's how we're gonna design this EV. Oftentimes right now we don't have a lot of information in terms of how the system operates okay. or you know what the, what the um, information I'm actually looking for uh, available to us. She's not the only one sounding the alarm. There's a bill calling for more access before the House of Commons. Number one, we won't know how to fix it. Number two, we also won't be able to train our technicians to, to fix them. So if you don't have that many providers, your cost is naturally going to go up. So the consumer is gonna have to pay more? 100%. And does it seem fair that you should have to take your EV to a dealership? I will ask you this, I'm a licensed technician. Is it fair that I take my vehicle, that I'm a licensed technician to another shop for another licensed technician to fix? To me, that's incredible that I need to do that. We reach out to two industry groups that represent the manufacturers, both the Global Automakers of Canada and the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association say there's a voluntary agreement in place for sharing information and mechanics have what they need to make repairs. Back with Chad, we're at the Hyundai dealership for an update on his car. Chad, you just walked inside. Tell me what the latest is. Well, the latest is the battery has arrived and they've installed it in the car. You have a battery. I have a battery. But he can't take his car home just yet. So now they're waiting for that to come in, a new coolant warmer. Do you even want this car back? I'm not confident I want the car back. I want to make sure the car's 100%. And those gas receipts from his rentals? I'm going to hold on to them, and at some point, I'm hoping somebody's going to compensate me for them. Like, I bought the electric car for a reason, and, you know, I spent 15 months putting gas into another one. We reach out to Hyundai Canada about Chad's case. They reference supply chain issues, but acknowledge Chad should have received a new battery sooner. And they're working to ensure he's satisfied with next steps, including covering his gas expenses. Are we putting the proverbial card before the horse here. Do we need to have the infrastructure in place before we can all be driving these cars? You would need a public charging at a reasonable price, widely available, and with 2035 technology, not today's. The charging infrastructure is currently a weak link if you want 100% adoption. The feds want us all driving EVs, but is there a realistic plan to get us there? It's time for us to ask Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo. So we visited 12 locations. We had challenges charging at seven. We have to work hand in hand with, with, with provinces and territories and or companies, utilities, deploying charging stations to ensure that not only do we have charging stations, but, but, that, but that they are working. But do you think that's really working right now based on on the problems that we encountered and what other people are reporting? Your sample is a very small one. But there are problems. There, there are problems and, and we're working to address those problems. But what does that say about how well the system is working for Canadians? By and large, EV users are very, very happy. It's still an emerging sector. So of course, there's going to be wrinkles and, and things we need to, to ensure are, 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 are done better. And when it comes to pricing, why not have one consistent way of billing so that people can compare prices and also have some transparency? Well, I think transparency is, is, is key, certainly. And, 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 and those, those systems are, are, 
are known and, and hopefully and I, I think it is possible we will we will end up agreeing that we should we should all use the same system across the country using a kilowatt per hour system would be the best and most efficient system we also ask him about adding cold weather range information so consumers can make a more informed choice and I'm sure you would agree that cold weather impacts these cars it's widely accepted the impact on on, on the battery the, the impact of the cold is much less okay. now than it was four okay. years ago. It's th There's still an impact, absolutely. Okay, why not then help everyone out, post a cold weather range on the vehicles with those EnerGuide stickers when people are car shopping? Wouldn't that help people make a more informed choice? Um, not something, first time I, I, I hear about this, I would certainly talk to the minister and ministry responsible to get their views uh, on, 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 on the feasibility and, and what would be the advantages of, of doing that. But are you happy with how fast we're moving? Because consumers are not. We're, we're, I want us to move faster, of course. We'll be keeping our eyes on the road ahead, too.